Hi, I'm Don Feaster, and I'm here with Michael Bradshaw, and today is July 10th, 2022. And I'm Meredith Blackwell, and we're on the campus of the University of Florida at Gainesville in, in the Hilton Hotel on that campus. So, Michael. Yes. <laughs> we always begin these with, why don't you tell us a little bit about your about myself yourself. okay you know, where you grew up your family education that kind of thing okay well first off thank you guys for interviewing me and having me it's yeah. really an honor especially with you two great mycologists and i'm sure that there were so many other great mycologists that you interviewed and it, it really means a lot to me that you also chose to interview me we want to get a full spectrum yes <laughs> um so you want you know a lowly postdoc like me to go along yeah, with the exactly. yeah. I don't think postdocs are lowly. <laughs> we were each one. Yeah, of course. Um, but yeah, I re I really appreciate it. Um, just a little bit about myself is I grew up in the Bay Area in San Francisco, or right outside of San Francisco in Mill Valley. Uh, it's such a beautiful place. Uh, I really loved my childhood, and when I was getting ready to go to college, I knew I really liked agriculture, but my issue was. I didn't want to live so close to my mom. You know, I, <laughs> I love my mom, but I, I got into uh, a few colleges in the area, some UCs, San Francisco State, and my mom said, oh, this is great. You know, you can have lunch with me every day. And I thought, nah, you, you know. know. Your mother might have an economist. She knows. She, she knows I love her dearly. <laughs> okay. Uh, but as an 18-year-old, I just wanted some space. And I applied for the University of Delaware because I had heard they had a good ag program. I visited, and of course, there's like a, a big lawn. It was springtime. People were throwing Frisbee on the lawn. And I knew that that's where I wanted to go. Um, I started off as a pre-vet major. And at this time, I was really interested in exotic animals. I liked lizards, snakes, uh, tortoises, turtles. I had my my room was just full of different exotic animals. And I wanted to be, like my dream at the time was to be an exotic animal vet. And I signed up as like a pre-vet major at University of Delaware and it was all farm animals, you know? Like <laughs> my first semester we stuck our hand up a cow's butt to feel for the cervix, you know, to see what it was like to artificially inseminate. I think we've seen that on all creatures, great and small. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that was an experience, and I realized that I didn't want to be a pre-vet major anymore. Farm animals wasn't really my interest. But it, at Delaware, there are so many beautiful botanical gardens all around. And they're all DuPont gardens, and they all donated their gardens. And that's where I really fell in love with horticulture. And I really loved botanical gardens. and. Um, I worked at a few botanical gardens, and I worked at the soil testing lab at the University of Delaware. And, you know, I really spent a lot of time learning all the different plants, and that's what led me to, right after I graduated, I worked at all these different gardens. Um, and what was really cool about working at these gardens is they have these programs where you rotate be between the different areas of the garden. So you can learn all of that it takes to run a botanical garden. Um, and then I started my master's degree. Should I keep going about sure, myself? Yeah, or? Sure. Okay. This is all about you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I'll just keep going. Um, so I started my master's at the University of Washington. And I worked with Sarah Reichard, who was the... Wait, I want to go back to the botanical garden. Mm -hmm. You're working with fungi that grow in weeds. Now. Now yeah. I am. Yeah. yeah. So then. you didn't know this one. You didn't even notice them then? Oh, I definitely noticed them then. And plant pathology was an interest of mine. And for my master's of science, I worked with the botanical garden director. And she said, you can do whatever you want, but let's keep it like a little bit on the plant end. And I knew that I liked plant pathology. You know, when you're at these botanical gardens, you have this great diversity of plants. So of course, you're going to have this great diversity of pathogens and, yeah. and fungi. And so I chose to study with powdery mildew. Um, in, in, Washington. in Washington State with, for my master's degree. And we, it was more of an applied sense. It was looking at 
different control methods for powdery mildew. And this was like just a crazy coincidence. The powdery mildew I was collecting was on chrysanthemum. I collected it and I sequenced the ITS and it turned out that this was um, a first report. Like the plant disease do, do these first reports of X disease in X place. Well, they're important though. Those are, they're really important and it really helps you determine the spread of these different yeah. fungi. And I submitted a first report paper and uh, the reviewer denied it. They said that, oh, you know, this was probably reported in America, but it was hidden under a different name. And I fought back. I was like, How do you know that someone who reported it under this name meant this, this species? And uh, the reviewer took away his anonymity. And it turned out it was Uva Braun, who's like the powdery mildew expert. Of the world. Of the world, yeah. And <laughs> he, I, he, I think he really respected that I fought him on this. And we've met since then. And he likes this story, like how we met. He was a, a reviewer who denied my paper. And I wouldn't, hit, I wouldn't take the denial. Um, so he relented? Yeah, yeah. He, he, he changed his mind. He said, as long as you write, it's the first unequivocal report. So just a little change of the, the wording. And at that point, it was the name was the anamorph name, Euoidium chrysanthemi. And he said, you know what? Let's use your sequence data, and let's write another report. And let's place it in the uh, teleomorph genus. And I said, great, I'm going to get two papers out of this. So then that started me working with Uva Braun. But for my PhD, I still, I still, like, my dream at this point was to maybe work in a botanical garden and uh, be a professor and conduct research, but also run the botanical garden, kind of like um, Ned Friedman. So a job yeah. like, a job at like that. At, yeah, yeah, Ned Friedman at the Arnold Arboretum. And... I started working with her, and at this time, right, her. Uh, Sarah Record for my PhD. Yeah, yeah and um, we were going to work with invasive plants, and you know, all in, I think it's like ninety percent of invasive plants in North America came from the horticulture industry. So my idea at this time was, oh, let's see if we can maybe breed sterile plants, and that's that's a, like my idea at the time was like, it would be nice if the Horticulture industry only was uh, sold sterile plants. You know, then they wouldn't spread, and especially these non-natives. So that was my idea, and maybe um, during my first few months of my PhD, I was watching her Sarah's cats while she was in South Africa, and uh, I got a phone call, and it was from the director of the school, and I was thinking, "Oh my God, what did I do? Yeah. Why did, why are they calling me?" And I was at her house, and he said that Sarah was in South Africa. She, she was 58 years old, and she had an aneurysm. Mm -hmm. And um, they were like, just make sure you stay and you watch her cats until her husband comes home. And I did that. And now I'm a PhD student. I'm fully funded. I had this IPM coordinator position, and I was a TA. So I'm fully funded, but I have no advisor at this point, and I have no project. Um, and I didn't really know what to do, and I really liked working with Uva. And so I contacted him, and I told him what happened, and, and I said, well, what do you think? Like, well, he's, and he said, you know, no one really studies powdery mildews in North America. I, I think that you should study powdery mildews. Uh, you can collect them from all around, and I'll be supportive and helpful and uh, help you with any papers that you want. And that's how I really got into my PhD, and I found an advisor, and his title was Invasion Ecology, uh, Professor of Invasion Ecology. And he's, by trade, he was an entomologist, but they hired him. You know, I think the school was being a little cheap. They didn't want to hire a plant pathologist. So they hired this entomologist with this broad title, Invasion Ecologist, who will also take on students who want to study plant pathology, even though he had no plant pathology experience. But he was great and really helpful and took me on. And I had a really successful PhD. You probably learned a lot. I learned so much. Uh, he did. He, he definitely learned a lot. Um, he learned a lot, and I learned a lot from him. And 
you know, he's so good at the scientific process that even though he wasn't an expert in mycology, he could still help me sure. uh, in general. And yeah, we, we developed a really great relationship. And right after that, I started a postdoc with the USDA right in the middle of COVID in, in Beltsville, which is an awesome facility. But when nobody's there, it, it, it kind of feels like the apocalypse is, is coming. There's... It's I like, think, yeah, I think we all felt that way a little bit, you know, wherever, yeah. wherever you were, you were by yourself. But boy, there you couldn't sneak in at all. No. And, and they let the plants go. Like, like if there's a, a sidewalk, they would let, they let the plants grow. So it's it really felt like the world was over. And they only let one person in the labs at a time. Um, but it was good experience. My my PI, uh, Wade Jerk, was actually went to university, got his PhD at University of Florida here. So he's a classic Southern man, I think. Um, loves the Gators. And we got along really well, and we had a good time. Um, but I was just studying one organism. I was studying Penicillium expansum. And I, I kept working a little bit with Ubai that never stopped because I had collected so many specimens from the University of Washington. And me and Don had been talking a little bit about potentially uh, working on a North American monograph of powdery mildews. And we were just brainstorming, of how can we get this done? And So you were looking beyond crop plants. Yeah. That's great. Were you finding things on the wild plants that At University of Washington? Were, were similar to the crop plants or the same? Did you ever find? Yeah. Yeah, so I found some. Um, like one of my big paper chapters for my PhD was powdery mildew on big leaf maple, which is an agricultural crop. Mm -hmm. But if you went, it's it's really wild. If you went to the University of Washington campus, I think there were like 600 maple trees, big leaf maple trees on campus. I did a survey and 599 of them were infected with powdery mildew. So almost every single tree on comp campus. And this is a native wild tree. It's, it's not an ornamental tree or an agricultural crop. And I also did like a quick survey, like percent of powdery mildew covering the trees. And it was, on average, the tree was 89% covered with mycelium, which is... Now, if you see his photographs, the, the trees look white. Yeah. That's amazing. It's yeah. incredible. And Okay, so what part of the question I was asking, too, was do you find that they're spread from that to any other plants? So, And do you think it's a native? Do you think it's a native powdery mildew? So I think the one on big leaf maple, because it infects them so highly. First off, this was a first, this was another first, first report. One. So, and it, the infection was so high that... You know, there have been mycologists that study powdery mildew in Washington State. Uh, Dean Glavi and um, even Joey Marotti and I talked to them. But I talked to Joey Marotti and he said that he didn't notice this infection so heavy in previous years. And, and if all the trees, my thought is, if all the trees are this infected, how could it go so long without being yeah. reported? So my thought there was that it was an undescribed species. I mean, uh, that it was an introduced mm -hmm. species. And but a lot of plant pathogens are not noticed until they cause infection on trees in a different locality. E exactly. So that's also could be a possibility. Um, so what I did was I looked at, at uh, first off, I collected maple trees from throughout the area. All from, and these are maple trees that are native to all different parts of the world and I inoculated them with powdery mildew to see which ones were the most infected. And of course, big leaf maple was by far the most infected. More than double, like a disease severity measurement, more than double uh, than the next closest tree, which was hedge maple, a native tree to England or Europe, somewhere in Europe. And that made me think that maybe it's an evolutionary naive host. Mm -hmm. So it didn't evolve with the powdery yeah. mildew. Um, and that's why it got noticed here. Yeah, that's why it got, it was so, the infections were so high. And then I also, this is something that interests me, is trying to determine the spread of these different pathogens through herbarium specimens. So I started sequencing herbarium specimens. And this species was first noted, the sequence was first noted in, in England in 1864 was my first sequence that I got. And the type was also described 
from Europe in 1812. Was Barclay involved? I, I can't remember. It's possible. But, but anyways, um, then the first sequence from North America was in 1930. So it's been here for a long time, but why, why didn't anyone notice it yet? So it's possible that one, that nobody, there was no mycologist that noticed it and, and picked it and deposited it in a herbarium. Another possibility I think is that there was a really long lag time between when this pathogen was introduced and when it started to cause an epidemic. And that's actually really common with um, introduced plant pathogens, is that sometimes you get this lag time. Maybe it's a genetic reason or... So could it have been a mutation? It, how, how far did it spread around your trees, your original? It was, I don't know, but when I started surveying, it was everywhere I found it. And I, and I also uh, asked people all the way down to California to collect for me, and they were finding it in California. So that was an interesting find, I think, yeah. too. And um, Was there any way it could have been introduced recently, you know, 30 years ago or 60 years ago? So I think it could have had multiple introductions. So we know that it had that introduction in the 19... Mm -hmm. There was that specimen from 1938. But it's also possible that maybe a more virulent strain was introduced mm -hmm. more recently. Or didn't get introduced. It could have been in North America, but not introduced into... The that part of North America. Until recently. Until more recently. Yeah, those those are really interesting questions that... Some of the ceratocystis uh, was that way. It was not noticed because it was already a disease and then there was a virulent one. So, um, yeah. is that... Yeah, it was ceratocystis, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. And so I think they knew there was one here and then all of a sudden there was this really awful... More, more virulent, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so it's the same kind of thing, and it just was worse. Yeah. And it was more, it was a recent introduction. Yeah. On top of the old introduction. It's really interesting. And I, I think that that's like, I am working on this North American monograph now of powdery mildews, but something that really interests me is trying to answer questions on when did this species first invade and from where did it invade through herbarium specimens? Because we have these amazing collections mm -hmm. um, from that people have collected for the past 200 years, and you can get such interesting data yeah. from them. And so he, you've been working on old specimens. Yeah, very so, old. Yeah, what, what's your record? Oh, for the oldest specimen? Yeah. Um, I sequenced a rust specimen from 1810. Yeah, it's the oldest, it's, it's a technicality, but it's the, it's the oldest specimen ever sequenced. It's yeah. 200, Oldest fungal specimen ever sequenced as of July 10th, 2022, <laughs> just so you guys know. Just a disclaimer. Um, but it is a little bit of a technicality because there was a lichen that was sequenced, and it was sequenced from 1794. Um, but at the time, but they sequenced it in 2004 or something. So at the time that they sequenced it, it was younger than the time I sequenced my specimen. Yeah. So that's my uh, that's my claim to fame so far. So you've had several firsts, and now this one. <laughs> yeah, um, there is a. I don't remember what the plant is, but Bob Gilbertson used to say he wanted to find this herbarium specimen, and it was the first plant that's recorded as having been collected in the United States. And he says it's always got a, par a fungal parasite on it, and he thinks that that way. You know, you could look at the plant and the fungus, and it would have been the oldest fungus collected, and maybe you could sequence that. Yeah, that would be interesting. I well, can't remember what the plant is. Well, I really, there's a really amazing specimen at the Farlow mm -hmm. that was collected on a, on a mummy. Uh, uh, the lichen. The, the lichen. lichen mummy. That was collected. You're kidding. Yeah, it was collected 3,000 years ago. Was it growing on the, the container, the mummy Used itself? as wrap as oh. part of the process. Okay. And it, go ahead. You you tell the story. No, no, you tell the story. <laughs> no, you're being interviewed. No, no I'll I'll you tell my so what you, you my feeling tell about your it. Version. Well, my version is that I really want to try and sequence the specimen, <laughs> and I was like brainstorming all the the titles that I could call the paper. It, it might be in science, you know, like 
Oh, the stories the mummy, a mummy will tell. I don't know. So many good titles you could have. Yeah, right. And, uh, Mummy's wrappings. Yeah. <laughs> um, but anyways, I, I requested to see if I could sequence it. Um, and I got denied. Oh. I'm, I'm not. On the basis of what? Uh, the, the methods weren't well, defined. It was that they had used secondary metabolites to already. I, I was just going to sequence the ITS. And my idea was that, oh, I could sequence it. I, I, didn't, I didn't sell it well enough, the story. And my idea was that I could sequence it. And uh, using the sequence data, I could tell where the lichen was native to and who the Egyptians were trading with. And so that was my selling point. Sounds good. Yeah, uh, but it turns out that someone had already identifying it, identified it using secondary metabolites. So that there wasn't a true reason to sequence the ITS if it had already been identified. This, this was not my decision. No, but I'm wondering, are those, is that more specific than the DNA? I, I, I'm not, I don't I study would, lichens. I wouldn't so. think so, but maybe. It, it may be a, another chance. I'm not, I'm not, I haven't given up yet. Okay. Maybe Dodd will request the and, same specimen. And let me tell you what, you would think there would be something like ketonium or some of the things that get fabric, I, I've had Oh, those. yeah, we don't, the only part we have is the lichen. We right. don't have the wrap. But I, uh, oh, you don't have the wrap. No. Oh, okay. You know, what yeah. they, apparently in Victorian times, people would acquire these mummies and they'd have a party at their home and they'd do a mummy unwrapping and it was a big deal. I thought and this, this was this was a lichen out of animal parts and, and umbrella stems out of elephant legs, but they did mummy and wrappings too. They did, and uh, <laughs> this the lichen ended up going to Edward Tuckerman, and Edward Tuckerman's herbarium came to Harvard, so that's why we had the specimen. How does the label read? He labeled it as. Uh, it, what was it, an osnia or a ramillaria or ramillaria? I can't remember I what it was. But he uh, lichen, you know, estimated three thousand years, something like that. Yeah. So you, you're pretty sure it was it, it was infected. It, the wrapping was infected with plutonium mummy and was well, no. Well, they buried, they but... used the lichen to as a preservative. <laughs> oh, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. So that it was part of the processing of mm -hmm. the like of the mummy, right. yeah. But it's really also amazing that whoever unwrapped the mummy also had the thought process to I think save we, it. Yeah, that well, we, you wonder who was there. You know that yeah. that's Michaela did a, a lot of work on trying to Michaela Schmuel, uh, who published a paper on this, but she did a lot of work of trying to track down kind of all the events around this mummy. And I think the mummy itself ended up at the Royal uh, Ontario Museum, uh, perhaps in Toronto. But they, it's well documented, I think. Yeah, I, I know that when um, I was at LSU, one of my postdocs once was called over. They had found a, a, a well, they had a casket with a body in it, mm -hmm. and, and there were a bunch of flowers inside it. And, and so this postdoc went over, looked for fungi on the plant. So maybe anthropologists have been interested in all mm. the other data yeah. Yeah. in the choir for but a long time. that's a sideline here. Yes, that is an interesting sideline, though. Yes, it is. I agree. But so now <laughs> you're working on powdery mildews in North America. Yep. And you're at the Farlow Herbarium. Yep. And you're using these specimens. Talk a little bit about the herbarium specimens and uh, the advantage that you have of working on those. Oh yeah, so I, I, we estimate that at the Farlow there's around 2,000 powdery mildew specimens. Um, so I have a lot to work Are with. Are they all identified? Well, that's the, the really great part about the collections at the Farlow and the collections uh, at most herbarium, the powdery mildews throughout America is that um, when Uvo Braun wrote his monograph in the 80s, he annotated just about every single specimen at major herbaria throughout North America. Wow. So every single specimen has his annotation on it, and they've been identified. 
and he's looked at them, and he's uh, a major part of this monograph. What year did he do it? I well, know. I'm not sure when the loan was, but the mm -hmm. monograph was 87. Seven. Yeah. And so, so he, he had done it before that. Yeah, yeah pre-DNA. And uh, yeah, and so he, he did these uh, morphological examinations of it, and that was the foundation for his uh, 1987 monograph. So it's really amazing. He did these so long ago, before we were really sequencing all the DNA, and now I'm using his annotations and his morphological assessments to uh, complement the sequence data. Okay. So we we have such an advantage over over. Uh, I mean, it's such an advantage over any other project in that the monographs are already the morphology part is already pretty much done. Now he won a prize uh, from the. Um the, what used to be called CBS in Utrecht, uh -huh. and it was for helping their their collection, and I think it must have been, it was it was powdery mildews. Do you know anything about I don't, that? Material? Well, no, yeah, it was powdery mildews, but he also had done work on no on mm -hmm. other uh, on imperfects, uh, oh, okay. rare malaria. Uh, yeah, I remember seeing that. So, yeah. so and it so may not be it was numbers. it was kind of a lifetime achievement award in yeah. a way For of the, yeah, having was, done right. these massive these works. The, yeah. Everything was massive. Yeah, big, big, big yeah. things that he did. So, uh, how are you going to present this monograph? What's what's the process that you're going through? Right um, now? Yeah. So, but first, I want to mention that when I met Uba. He told me that when he was look, he's looked at so many powdery mildews, and he said that uh, he originally didn't want to work on powdery mildews anymore because he was seeing them in his dreams. <laughs> and uh, luckily, I I'm not there yet. I'm not seeing them in my dreams, but one day maybe I'll start to see them in my dreams. Um, he told me that he was really seeing the appendages. You know, powdery mildews have these beautiful appendages, and he was seeing all these different appendages in his dreams, and uh, that's devo that's devotion, yeah. I think. Well, it, it's a, an interesting story too because I had edited and worked on his monograph in 1987, uh, Ubi's monograph. So I, I read the whole thing. And to have Michael back working on the Farlow collections and so forth, it's, it's kind of full yeah. circle. Yeah. Yeah. And you were well prepared for Michael. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really. <laughs> well, sure. Yeah, I really. Are we ever prepared for Michael? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it really is a great story how uh -huh. it's all coming together. Yes. And I'm really excited about it. And we're moving along really great. The. What, what Don was asking is that the end goal of our monograph is to have it all available online. Like we were talking, what, what is a modern monograph? And we think it's all available on a website, powderymildew.org. I don't, I, that might be taken already, but hopefully that's available, that URL. And right away. Yeah, you better hurry. Yeah. Since it's on the internet, someone might buy it. Yeah, they tried to sell it to me yeah. for, for a lot of money. Uh, I don't have very much money if you buy it, so you're not you're not going to make any money and off of it. You're not data. selling the book. Yeah. Um, no, so we're going to do it all electronically online, and we're going to have interactive keys. So you know, you'll uh, first you'll pick your host, and it'll give you a bunch of different morphological appendages to click on, and you can click on the appendage or the if it's the anamorph, the different canidia fours, uh, pictures of all the different uh, types of canidia fours, and um, it'll really help you. I, like the idea is that powdery mildews are really common plant pathogens, and a lot of plant pathologists who aren't mycologists work with them, and they have a lot of trouble identifying them. You can you go onto GenBank and you put in your your um, sequence, and you'll have all these different hits of people identifying it as different names. So it's con it's confusing if you're not an expert. So we're going to have, one, we're going to have verified sequences on, our, on the web page. So you can look to see which ones are um, verified by me, Uva, and Don. Mm -hmm. Also, we're going to have um, 
these interactive keys. And the idea is that well, novices can identify this pathogen very easily. And you can use morphology pretty well for that. Yeah. Yes. Um, for a point. To, yeah, there are a lot of um, species complexes that we're finding, but it's very easy to use a combination of, or I wouldn't say very easy, but it works well to use a combination of host data and morphology. A lot of times I can walk down the street and I can tell you the powdery mildew species just on the host, just based on the host. Like for, exa for example, someone in the bus ride said, oh, I really see powdery mildew on my catalpa. And I know, oh, that's yours, I feel elevata. But just no doubt. no doubt, yeah. I don't even, I don't need to look at it or anything. And I think that's really amazing, this strict co-evolutionary relationship. Sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. So are they on closely related plant host? Sometimes. Um, but are your species complexes on related hosts? Sometimes. <laughs> uh, for example, Irizyphe elevata mm -hmm. is the ITS matches 100% with Irizyphe vaccinii. Irizyphe vaccinii occurs on ericaceous hosts, mm -hmm. whereas Irizyphe elevata occurs on bignanioides. So. What's, yeah. what's happening there is... is yeah, a lot of host jumps and things yeah. happen. Yeah. So kind of like rust, some of the rust. Yeah. Yeah, so, so the, it's very interesting where you get this strict co-evolutionary relationship with some species and you get these tight ho host ranges for some, but then others, it's kind of like host jumping more random. And I think some of the insect-associated fungi are the same way. Some of the are that way. Yeah. But you do see general patterns, like Potosphera is a genus that mostly affects Rosaceae. And then Golovinomyces mostly affects Asteraceae, with exceptions. Yeah. Interesting. Great. So, yeah. OK, so, so your family, were they, did they understand what you're doing? Are they interested? Oh, yeah, I was just telling Dawn yesterday, my mom is a psychologist. My dad is a psychologist, and my sister, my oldest sister, is also a psychologist. And, and then my other sister. Have they diagnosed you yet? Oh, yeah. <laughs> they try to, too much. Uh, What's your sister do? Psychologist. <laughs> yeah, then my other sister, though, um, she was a wedding planner. <laughs> yeah. So the Psychology at a different level. <laughs> <laughs> you have to deal with a lot of yeah. unfortunate people planning weddings. So, yeah, you have to be a real good people person and read people. So yeah, I guess psychology in a way. Yep. Very different. Yeah. So I think that maybe because they were all psychologists, I was like, what's the complete opposite? <laughs> and then plant pathology, mycology. But it might have been wedding planner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. didn't know she needed psychology. Yeah. So yeah. that that's been interesting. Um, but they're all really supportive and they don't really understand what I'm doing, but they, they're always supportive and um, they, they think, when they think of mycology, they think of uh, Amanita muscaria and that's about it. Well, what about some of the treatments now for, for different kinds of mental illness? Um, some of, you know, there are a whole lot of studies being done right now with uh, philosophy. Yeah, I've, I've heard about that. Um, I, I know that they're not doing. Yeah, but are, are they interested? I wondered I if don't, you could relate to them better. Though. Yeah, I think so. Maybe I'll ask them about it and bring it up. And, <clears throat> and then there's some um, secondary metabolites. I guess mostly now we know them from blue-green bacteria, blue-green cyanobacteria. But uh, some of those are supposed to be associated with uh, Alzheimer's, ALS, and Parkinson's. So who knows what the fungi are. I told Michael yesterday that if he were studying algae and he was a phycologist, he would fit right in the family. <laughs> <laughs> it would really confuse people. It would. It would be very confusing. <laughs> oh, they have four psychologists. No, no, no. <laughs> Three psychologists and a Psychologist. <laughs> yeah. So what would you say to your, your cohort, your uh, uh postdocs who are out there trying to move on? 
What would I say? What would you say to him? It's a rough world out there. <laughs> it's a dog eat dog world out there. You sound like you're having fun though. Yeah, of course. I love my my job and I love my work and I love working at the Farlow. It's it's such an amazing place to work. Uh, one, the building is it's so cute. I don't even know. How about the haunted? word? What about late at night? Well, late at or night. Those stairs into the attic. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't go up those the the ladder up into the oh I was just talking about the, the oh the, main the main staircase going up to the second floor oh there's or this the basement there's this ladder that just goes up into the ceiling I always wondered mm, have you been up there Don I've looked in of course <laughs> uh, yeah, I used to feel that I, if I was there at night it was creepy I I uh, yeah. was there very few times but I thought it was creepy with the ghost of lots of other mycologists. That that's yeah, the well, feeling. That, that's kind of it. You yeah, you have to yeah. think about it that way. It's but it's you know such a wonderful place. And and the history and and even all the furniture around you it's all beautiful and there's these amazing books and diaries. It's just a really you can feel it just when you're there that it's such an incredible place to to be. And I'm really happy. Yeah. Good. Well, thank you. We're really happy that you did this. See, it, it wasn't too painful. <laughs>